Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Derek Miller. I'm the president and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber. We're so grateful that you are joining us this afternoon, along with the Chamber and our partner at the World Trade Center Utah for this webinar on the Russia-Ukraine war. As we continue to see daily Ukraine defend itself against an unprovoked and unjustified invasion by Russia, we also see the spiraling consequences of the conflict, how that is impacting trade, travel, supply chains, and the list goes on and on. During the briefing this afternoon, we're grateful to have Senator Mitt Romney and other local business leaders who are joining us to provide a strategic geopolitical assessment of the conflict, discuss also what business and community leaders need to know during this time. We're thrilled to be joined by Senator Mitt Romney, who serves on the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. We also have joining us Natalie Gochner, who's the director of the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah, and also serves as the chief economist for the Salt Lake Chamber. And we also have Miles Hansen, the president and CEO of the World Trade Center Utah. For those of you who are participating, we, and if you have any questions during the webinar, please feel free to submit those questions using the Q&A function. We're going to do our best to have time, in addition to hearing our, from our presenters, that we reserve time to also answer as many questions as we have. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on the Salt Lake Chamber's website. We uh, want to start by asking uh, Natalie uh, and Miles to introduce themselves and their organizations and then we'll hear from Senator Romney. But Natalie, why don't we go ahead and hear from you first? Great, thank you, Derek. So uh, glad to join all of you. Uh, this is a serious and somber topic, but uh, at the Kempsey Gardner Policy Institute, uh, where I work and, and lead the enterprise, we are part of the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah. And we specialize on the Utah economy and demographics and uh, Putin's war of choice is uh, definitely exacting a cost on the global economy, the national economy, and on the Utah economy ultimately. And so it'll be my uh, job today to walk you through how we're calling those um, impacts. And at the Gardner Institute, we like to say we're an honest broker and help people make informed decisions. And so we want to do that for you today. Miles? Great. Thank you, Derek, for, for convening us today. And thank you, Natalie. My name is Miles Hansen and work at World Trade Center Utah. And World Trade Center Utah exists to accelerate growth for Utah businesses. We do that in close partnership with the Salt Lake Chamber, with the Gardner Institute, with the state, and with Utah's inter international business community. And a key aspect of that is making sure that we are working closely with all of our partners, including the Chamber, the Gardner Institute, to understand what's happening out in the world, and then to be able to provide expert advice to companies that are in the trenches reacting to uh, these geopolitical uh, events that are happening around the world. So whether it's a global supply chain crisis, a global pandemic, a, a, a criminal war uh, of uh, Russia uh, attacking Ukraine and, and, and doing everything it can to destroy Ukraine, uh, we are here as a resource to the community uh, to plug in and provide uh, expert advice and to do whatever we can to solve problems, open doors, and generate momentum for uh, Utah companies that are out there competing and winning around the world. Excellent, thank you, Miles, and, and thank you also, uh, Natalie. Um, we, were, we were made aware just before we began the webinar that Senator Romney was called down to the Senate floor to, to do a vote, and that he's gonna be joining us in, in just a few minutes. And so while we're waiting for him, Natalie, could we go ahead and jump back to you and have you sort of uh, set the table for us as far as you know the global economy, the impacts, to the economy and, and what we're already seeing and what we might expect to see. Yeah, happy to do that, Derek. And I, I actually will call up a presentation, but uh, when we see the Senator, I'll, I'll uh, transition to him. But, you know, everyone, I've been calling this uh, Putin's war and now I've decided to call it Putin's war of choice. And now after hearing Miles, I'm thinking I should call it Putin's criminal war of choice. Um, it's, uh, it's really uh, hurtful what we're watching. and. Uh, Leon Trotsky, of course, was a, a Russian-Ukrainian um, Marxist who was an enemy to Stalin, who was in exile, who was executed in Mexico City. 
but he wrote a lot about the conflict of ideas and he, he it's debated, but he, you know, I like to think that he coined the famous phrase, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And that's where we find ourselves. Um, prior to um, Putin's invasion, we had a risk matrix that we were following and tracking. The pandemic was winding down. There was a refresh going on in the economy, record number of jobs in Utah and other places. And as you look at this matrix, you can see uh, what we're monitoring. So with that as a setup, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here and turn to uh, Senator Romney to uh, share his message and then I'll jump back in when, when needed. Uh, Senator, turn the time to you. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I can't imagine interrupting Natalie Gochner uh, with the wisdom you have to share uh, for the members of the chamber. Uh, I, uh, I'm embarrassed to do that. I'm sorry to come in late. I uh, appreciate the chance to, uh, to uh, speak with you all. I'll be uh, sort of describing a bit of, of uh, I think, the same topic that Natalie has taken on. Um, uh, you know, I said before, you probably heard me say this, that I agree with Yogi Berra. I, I don't like uh, forecasting, uh, particularly if the future's involved. And uh, it's very difficult to assess what's going to happen going on uh, from here. But let me tell you sort of what is and where I think that uh, that heads over uh, the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, and of course, Ukraine is the topic at, at, at hand. Um, there are a couple of things that I think we've seen that are informative. One is uh, Russia's military has long been known as not being very good at logistics, but we figured that by now they would have figured it out. And they still have logistic problems that uh, have plagued them. And as a result, they've really bogged down uh, in many aspects of their, of their conquest of, of Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, I think we've been uh, pleasantly surprised, impressed, inspired by the courage and the de determination and resolve of the Ukrainian people and its uh, heroic uh, leader, um, who uh, has really, I think, uh, become a, a monumental historical figure um, for much of what he has done. Um, he has asked, as you know, for a no-fly zone uh, over parts of Ukraine. The challenge with that is it would mean that NATO or the US in particular would potentially have to shoot down Russian jets or they would have to shoot down ours. If that were to happen, we'd be having the first conflict between major powers since the uh, Second World War. And that of course could escalate into a massive uh, world war. And that is something we are uh, not willing to enter into. Um, but the other, on the other hand, he's also said, if you can't do that, give us some jets, some MiG jets because their pilots know how to fly the MiGs. Uh, Poland announced today that they are providing, I think it's 27 MiG jets to uh, the US uh, in our uh, Ramstein uh, Air Base in Germany. Uh, they're gonna fly, fly them there. They're gonna say, okay, it's up to the US to decide what to do with these jets that we just gave you. So we got uh, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of old jets. And uh, I, I presume that the uh, president will follow the bipartisan uh, uh, strong sentiment in the, on the part of Congress, which is get these jets to the to the leaders in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. Um, one question is, what's the ambition of, of, of Vladimir Putin? What's he doing here? Uh, and, and there are some who believe that, that he just didn't like the idea that Ukraine might become a part of NATO, and that's probably part of it. But I think a bigger element at play uh, is that Vladimir Putin is trying to reestablish much of the old Soviet Union. Uh, he felt that the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1989 was the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. Uh, and given what else happened in the 20th century, it's extraordinary that he would say that. Uh, but he's trying to reassemble the old Soviet Union, uh, obviously not in exactly the same way, but putting that together. And he has been highly successful uh, in many respects already in, uh, in putting nations under his control. Um, and, uh, and he, uh, Ukraine is, is the next in that line. And, and there are others, of course, whether Lith Lithuania or Moldova, or others that are concerned that he might be uh, moving on them, on men, them uh, next. Um, I, you know, I, I, I would also note that not only does he have that ambition, but he has a level of brutality that is um, hard for us to identify with, to, uh, to simply imagine that a human being could have, to literally wipe out a people, to obliterate their city, uh, and, and a people who have not in any way attacked him or threatened him or uh, done something to abuse his country, just to attack them and, and wipe them out because you want power over them. It's an extraordinary thing and tells you the kind of thing he might do in the future. 
as you know, the sanctions have been uh, that we have levied have been historic in nature. We've never sanctioned a central bank uh, for the period of time and in the extensive way we've sent, uh, sanctioned the uh, the Russia Russian uh, central bank. Other sanctions as well are are extraordinary and are having a dramatic impact on Russian markets. You know, the ruble has fallen in half. Um, and, uh, and their economy will take a long time to reboot. They will surely go into a recession or worse. Uh, what I would note though, for your benefit, is that um, these things have unintended consequences, uh, which is sanctioning Russia uh, and of course, uh, Ukraine being under um, uh, you know, wartime footing uh, will have a big impact around the world. Uh, commodity prices uh, hit uh, all time records uh, in various markets today. Uh, you probably heard that nickel, which is re you know required to make uh, stainless steel, for instance, they had to stop trading at uh, nickel today when it reached $100,000 a ton. Um, uh, other commodities, uh, copper and so forth, the titanium uh, are, are very much at risk. Boeing, for instance, gets all their titanium uh, from, uh, uh, from Russia. And titanium is, is uh, absolutely essential to make the kind of aluminum that goes into making aircraft. So. Uh, th there are going to be some some consequences, and I, um, I you know, I, I don't know how far these will spread. Uh, there are some who think it will cause uh, Europe, in particular, to fall into recession, uh, and uh, and it could conceivably uh, pull us along with them. Um, uh, there will be impacts on China as well. So obviously, a great deal of uncertainty coming from th this uh, this horrific invasion uh, by Russia. And then at the same time, you've got something going on here, which is inflation. And inflation is only going to get worse, uh, given what's happening with Ukraine, given what's happening with, uh, with oil. The president today said, we're going to stop buying oil from Russia. That, that's about 4% of our oil. Hard to replace that because it's heavy crude. Uh, and we don't have a lot of sources of heavy crude. And we don't have, we could, by the way, if we'd have built the Keystone pipeline, we'd have had a lot more sources of heavy crude, but we did not build it. And it's in disrepair now. So we can't turn that on, um, and uh, and so we're gonna we're gonna feel it at the pump. We already are. It's probably gonna get probably gonna get worse. Uh, wheat, uh, Russia and uh, and Ukraine are responsible for a uh, probably the largest single share of wheat exports in the world, uh, and and what that means here, what that means abroad, uh, is uh, uncertain. I, I would anticipate prices on agricultural commodities are gonna go up here. It's gonna be a good time to be a a rancher, a farmer, particularly if you can grow wheat or corn or, or, or other uh, basic commodities. Uh, and I would expect there to also be some shortages by virtue of the, the, uh, the sanctions that are being placed on, on those countries. Um, so all in all, it's a uh, challenging time to be a, uh, a business person and to be planning for, uh, for what comes forward. I, I, would, I would note, I go back to my career when I was in business and we were making investments and and we decided that we couldn't predict what was going to happen. I, I used to joke that I had one partner who had predicted seven of the last two recessions. And, uh, uh, and, and it's just very hard to tell what, what's going to happen. Uh, I, I, I think we have a good sense that what's coming, at least over this coming year, is going to be challenging. Uh, hopefully not as challenging as what happened with COVID. But it, gosh, if we have another variant that hits us like Omicron did, why just Katie bar the doors? Um, but I, I think what happens in, in most successful enterprises is you put your head down and you you invest in the future, uh, whether it's good times or bad, and uh, and and weather the storm as best as you possibly can. And and by the way, let me know if there are things uh, that we can do in Washington uh, to make it easier for you to you know survive and succeed uh, in the environment that happens to be presented. So with that, uh, Derek, I'll turn back to you. Or I guess to Natalie. We'll let Natalie make uh, uh, sense out of all that confusion and hopefully give us some guidance. <laughs> Natalie, good to be with you. Natalie, let me let me interject here for just a moment. First of all, Senator Romney, to thank you for, for that overview and for taking time. We know you're in the midst of, of floor votes right now, and, and so you're running, running up and down some flights of stairs here. But while we have you for just another moment, um, a, a quick observation and, and then hopefully a quick question for you. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, um, that you don't like to make predictions, especially when they're about the future, uh, quoting the late great Yogi Berra. Uh, but in some ways, you actually did this 10 years ago uh, in, in a presidential debate. 
when you said that, that Russia was the greatest geopolitical foe of the US, what did you see 10 years ago uh, that maybe others didn't see that has led us to this point today? You know, Derek, in, in, all, in all truthfulness, um, I, I happen to think that the Obama administration saw things the same way I did, but thought they could score political points and had a good line they wanted to launch uh, in a debate. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that they didn't realize that Russia was a geopolitical foe. Uh, geopolitical doesn't mean that they are the biggest threat or the strongest military or whatever, but it means that they're playing geopolitics and they surely were then as they are now. Uh, they were supporting uh, Assad in Syria. Uh, they now support Maduro in Venezuela. They were supporting the North Koreans. Basically, all the all the nations that author that are authoritarian oppress their people. Uh, the the ones that are developing nuclear weapons, uh, like North Korea, th th these are the people supported by Russia. So they are were then and continue to be a geopolitical adversary. China, interestingly enough. Um, sort of plays geopolitics, uh, you know, very close to the vest and, and does not uh, go out in the world stage in an aggressive, visible way, uh, in a way that's hostile uh, to uh, democracies, but is very effective in their invisible approach. So taking over uh, international organizations like the WTO or the WHO uh, and, uh, and, and doing their, uh, their mischief uh, through, through vehicles that we're not watching very carefully is their approach. Uh, so today they're both geopolitical uh, players uh, and long-term of course, uh, and even now, uh, China represents a greater long-term threat to Americans' prosperity uh, and to our military uh, leadership in the world. Uh, than Russia does. Ru Russia's economy is really kind of a basket case. Were it not for their energy resources, they'd be uh, really a, a, a second tier uh, a power. But, uh, but China has a huge population, obviously very competitive with a whole series of products and represents a real challenge to us long term. Thank you for that, Senator. And, and then maybe just quickly, uh, a second question again before we, we might lose you. You referenced the announcement just a, a few short hours ago uh, from President Biden about banning uh, the Im importing you know, of oil, Russian oil. Um, you referenced the Keystone Pipeline, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, and I'm sure our attendees would too, uh, the, uh, about what about our own domestic uh, uh, sources of oil and natural gas and, and what we could be doing to actually use uh, creating jobs, uh, helping our own economy along the way. If we, were, if we were using those resources, I think there is a bit of irony in the fact that we're going to Venezuela, which in many ways is in a parochial relationship with Russia, looking for, to them to help bail us out when we may have the answer right here at home. What are your thoughts about that? Well, it, it is unacceptable for the United States of America to be going to Maduro in Venezuela asking for oil or doing the same in Iran. Absolutely wrong and unacceptable. Uh, and, and I hope the administration, if they've been engaged in that, stops it. Uh, the, uh, the answer for America is to develop our own energy resources. I, I know that many of the elite environmentalists uh, don't want us to be drilling for oil and, and, and gas, but you know, they want us to go to renewables. Look, I wanna have renewables as well, but let's have the renewables in place before we shut off the oil and gas. You can't, you can't have uh, the US and the world uh, absent energy. And, uh, and, and it's foolhardy uh, for us not to produce as much oil and gas as we possibly can for us here domestically and for our friends in Europe. Look, th these sanctions are gonna be hard to keep in place if people start seeing prices at the pump go up and up and up, if Europeans are, are freezing in their homes. I mean, um, we're gonna get weak knees uh, globally uh, you know, unless we can provide uh, the energy that people need to get to work, to heat their homes uh, and, and to have jobs. So yeah, the, the right answer is for the president to say, uh, uh, you know, following Elon Musk, drill baby drill, all right? Drill, get, some, get more wells. Uh, if we haven't got uh, heavy uh, crude uh, available uh, in, um, in places that we wanted, drill in, you know, in, in the high Uintas and get, to, or in the Uintas, uh, you know, get the, Get the crude, get the uh, the rail line out to price, so we can get this into the into the uh, Gulf where they could be it could be refined. I mean, these these are the kinds of things that President ought to be saying. I, I thought his his speech, his uh, uh, State of the Union speech, was uh, sorely lacking in saying, "Hey, the world has changed. 
in just the last few days, given, given Russia's invasion. And, uh, and so here are the things we're gonna have to do differently. And energy would be one of those where a, a very robust American uh, energy policy uh, should have been announced. And, and I think it's just the enviros, uh, these elite environmentalists uh, that make their living off of getting contributions uh, are, are, uh, are keeping the, the Democrat leadership from doing what they know they really ought to be doing, which is getting oil from the US and not getting oil from uh, our, our most uh, awful adversaries. Thank you, Senator. Natalie, you love data. Give us the data that, sh that proves the points. All right, happy to do that. Thank you, Senator, for your comments. Well, so I'm just showing your risk matrix, right? And along the horizontal axes, you've got the economic impact of the risk and on the vertical axis, the likelihood. And we're monitoring this before uh, Putin's war of choice. But now all the things in red are the things that have just been set off, right? And what makes this so uh, damaging in my mind is that it's not an isolated thing, it is a rippling thing that has so much uncertainty associated with it, so much so that I've called it a black swan, what has happened, and I, I put down here, now the risk isn't a black swan, it's another black swan, which I've never in my career uh, found myself saying. So a couple of caveats, I mean, the Senator mentioned how difficult it is to forecast. Um, as I think about presenting work like this, I want to always recognize the massive human toll. And, and I, this is more about humanity than it is about economics. And I don't feel like evil is too strong a word. I love um, what uh, our former Secretary of Defense said, there are known knowns, known unknowns, and unknown unknowns. And that's definitely the world we're in. Because I have to put some numbers out there, I'm going to do a baseline scenario that basically says that the Russian troops go no farther than Ukraine and disruptions to these commodities are significant but limited and temporary as markets adjust. But there's so many um, what I'll call darker scenarios that exist. And then I've just kind of listed some of the things that, we're, that you have to think about and watch. And I'll just, as the Senator mentioned, don't forget the pandemic because it, it could, could show itself. So in the Putin war, the way I think of it is a, is a series of concentric circles. And starting on the left, it's just catastrophic to the Ukrainian economy. And then if you move to the Russian economy, debilitating, just the, 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 these uh, sanctions are shock and awe. And so debilitating the Russian economy, as you go out to the European Union, again, under a baseline scenario that's limited, so very challenging, but manageable. Then when you go across the ocean to the US, impactful but modest if it's contained. And then by the time you get to Utah, it'll be measurable but minor. Now, I don't want everyone to just tune off because you have a darker scenario than this. Go ahead and fill that in as you see it. But the principle is that the connections get weaker and weaker the further away you get. Uh, so the Russian economy does get crushed. And this is what Moody's is doing for the real GDP percent change a year ago. In black, it was their pre-invasion baseline outlook. And Senator's right. Uh, you can see how badly they were doing, right? They were looking to get to just stagnant, no growth. And then this will catapult them down minus eight, maybe minus 10% uh, cut, uh, definitely a recession for them. When you think of not having air traffic, when you think of not having access to the SWIFT international payment system, uh, something that I think is really instructive, and I'm going to go ahead and do this because I think it's so interesting. But if you go look at the, uh, let's, let's, I'm going to take you to Treasury and look at the, the press release right after the invasion. So this is the press release that came out from Treasury in February of 24. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And, and again, the sanctions have gotten worse since then. This is February 24th. But if you just look at this, as I just thumb through this, uh, targeting the, the financial institutions, and they, they tell them by name. So you're seeing those. Blocking of all the other major financial transition uh, companies, you see that. Debt and equity uh, prohibitions, and you see that, and they list them by name. And then you see the licenses that are affected. Now look at this, new actions targeting Russian elites, families close to Putin, they, they, they say them by name and by affiliation within the family. And this goes on and on and on. And by the time you get to, towards the bottom, you're seeing all the subsidiaries and all the things that have been um, stopped. 
And I just think that's a really telling example. And of course, it's only gotten more uh, significant since then. So Russian economy gets, uh, gets crushed. So now you have to think about what are the linkages between Russia and Ukraine and the rest of the globe? And it becomes these global exports. And you can see over here on the right, this is the percent of global totals that come from here. So the Senator mentioned titanium, how difficult that is to lose a source for the aerospace industry. I want to focus on neon for just a minute. This is used in uh, semiconductors and chips, 70% of the world's supply. Uh, I understand that neon is stockpiled right now, and so this won't hit for a while, but these are the types of things you see, and you see 12% oil, maybe 3%, 70% natural gas. So what we look at in economics is we try and extend these links and see where they take us. Um, if I look at the US uh, and global oil supply and demand, you can see here the US rig count. So the pandemic hits, the rig count drops, we got to zero in our state. Uh, we're still in the single digits is my understanding, but, but it's climbing and you would expect this to happen. This is pre-pandemic. Uh, and so you expect uh, global oil supply, all the other places to, to ramp up demand. If you look at oil prices, uh, red is the pre-invasion forecast. So we're, we're around $70 per barrel. And you can see this spike getting up to 140 and then the market does its thing and we're trying to bring it back down. But there will be impacts from that. If we look on the consumption side, what we look at is who uses gasoline on a per capita basis. And in, in Utah, as you can see, we are one of the lower per capita uh, users of gasoline in the country. Might surprise people because we drive long distances, but we are uh, very compact, very urban. Uh, now, if we look at oil production by state, and this is very interesting because, you know, when oil prices rise, if you're not an energy producing state, you only hurt. But if you're an energy producing state, you can benefit from it, at least the industries that are based on oil and the spillover effects of oil. And I believe we're the 11th largest oil production state uh, in the country coming uh, out of the Uinta Basin. And, and you see that here. Uh, also food prices, and I just thought the best way to show that is to look what wheat for futures are doing and, and fertilizer, and you can kind of see they were already on their way up. Part of Putin's um, evil here is the, the really, uh, really um, spectacular timing, if I can say it that way, that we were already hurting in so many places, inflation coming out of this and, and for him to do this. So now if we look at the linkages between the US and Russia, it's not a very strong linkage. And you can see the various states, these are small, small numbers. Uh, in Utah, and you can see we're one of the smaller um, linkages there. So I'm gonna focus on 2019 because it's pre-pandemic and doesn't have all the pandemic effects. But we, we export about $17 billion worth of merchandise from the Utah economy. And in, in the, in Russia and Ukraine, uh, we, we export about 20 million, just 20 million to Russia and 9 million to Ukraine. Uh, Miles, please speak up if you have numbers that look any different than that. And so if we look at merchandise exports from our state, here I'm showing you 2019 and 2020, they're not that different, but these are our top trading partners and you have to go all the way down to 43rd to find Russia and all the way down to 55th to find Ukraine. So these, these linkages are, are small. And then if you look at what the linkages are, like what do we export to Russia? Well, it's food, it's machinery, manufacturing, chemicals, computers. Those are the big ones. And if I look at the same for Ukraine, food, computers, manufacturing, chemicals, some sort of some similar. I didn't put it in this slide deck, but we have a similar data for imports from Ukraine, uh, just as an example. My husband went out and bought a load of Baltic birch yesterday because it's manufactured in Ukraine and he wanted to stockpile of it. Well, so uh, just to close down here, um, the, the forecast is that US GDP slows down uh, because of this. And so the February baseline uh, is, was blue here. You know, under a lengthy conflict scenario, we go worse and then you, know, you pop up and then you return. And then under the uh, what I'll call the rapid resolution scenario, you can see what happens to, to GDP there. That's sort of the dynamics we're looking at. Uh, interestingly, in Utah, just like so many times, it was the truth with the pandemic, it's the truth now, but we enter into this world conflict 
uh, in very good um, position. Uh, we have the fastest growing economy in the nation. We're one of only four states whose economy has grown over the last two years. This is just the most recent state-by-state -state data, December 2019 to December 2021. And you can see the three states here plus Texas have grown. I'm expecting an incredibly hard hit to consumer sentiment, uh, both in Utah and the US. The gray here is US, the red is Utah. We have a, a better view of our economy uh, than, than the US, but we're still not back up to uh, the pre-pandemic levels. And with that, I just have a Peggy Noonan quote I want to share. The West is on the right side. It should keep its height, keep its nerve and hold together. Be cool, press hard, resist. And if we do that, I think we have the best chance of this being a, a more limited uh, problem for us. Natalie, so that, thank there, I'll go back to you. Thank you for that, Natalie. And I, I want to ask a question. I want, I'd love for both you, Natalie, and for you, Senator Romney, to, to respond to this question based on your individual perspectives. And Natalie, you talked about the sanctions and the impact of the sanctions, but I want to ask you a question about the, sh the sanctions themselves. Are, are you surprised at how quickly uh, the, a large part of the world was able to unite in cutting Russia out of the game? in cutting Russia out of the system. Um, you know, it's sort of this rule, if you're not gonna play by the rules, you don't get a play. And, and were, were you surprised by that? And is there anything more that you think from an economist perspective that could be done on the sanction side? And then Senator Romney, maybe you can tell us, is there more being considered in Washington DC either by Congress or out of, out of the White House? Uh, so Derek, if you're going to me first, I mean, I just, we have created a fortress around, uh, around Russia and it, I believe it is unprecedented. It's extraordinary and credit to uh, the, the nations that unified to make this happen. The one that I was looking for is the one that happened today with, uh, with the oil ban. And I, I'm just going to speak for myself, but when I fill up my tank, I'm going to feel like I'm doing something for the Ukrainian people. Thanks, Natalie. Senator? Uh, yeah, I think um, you have to give uh, uh, the president and his administration uh, some, uh, well, some real credit for uh, assembling so many nations uh, within NATO and some with outside, outside of NATO uh, to come together to put in place the sanctions that, uh, that, that were established. I think um, uh, they would have been even tougher at the outset. Uh, had we had the full confidence of all the members of NATO, but they were pretty tough even at the beginning and they've gotten tougher in part because the public opinion around the world, whether it's uh, here, but particularly in Germany and France and, and Denmark and so forth has been so overwhelmingly opposed to Russia that uh, the nations have been willing to sign up for, uh, for stiffer sanctions than I think uh, might have been anticipated. And, and so I, you know, I give the Biden administration credit for one, getting people on board. I think one of the ways they did that was sharing intelligence information with these nations before the invasion. And, and you know, there are numbers, I think France in particular was one of the number that said, hey, I don't think they're going to invade. We disagree with your intelligence community, intelligence community. but then when they did, uh, it gave us a lot of credibility. And, and uh, so kudos for all that work. The, the big error of this administration was not providing sufficient arms to Ukraine uh, to really frighten Russia. Uh, and uh, and that, that I think was an error, not just in this administration, but in prior administrations, uh, Republican and Democrat. We just didn't uh, take the, the threat of a Russian invasion seriously enough to make sure that Ukraine had the defensive weaponry it needed to repel an attack in a very aggressive way. But remarkably, they're doing a heck of a job. Uh, the uh, there are additional sanctions being considered. The, the biggest is whether our decision to uh, uh, not import oil from Russia will be picked up by other nations. I think it's pretty clear that this administration has told our European friends, you don't need to follow us uh, on that. We're not going to push you to follow us on that. You can do what you think is in your in interest. We, we don't want there to be such, uh, such an economic blowback in, in Europe that their willingness to stand by the sanctions weakens. So uh, we're letting them make their own assessments. But that's, that, of course, was the big one. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, there are additional individuals that are being considered, additional companies, and then so-called secondary sanctions, which means sanctions on banks that are uh, allowing Russia to sell oil and gas elsewhere. Uh, those kinds of sanctions would, again, have a, big, have a much bigger impact on Europe than they would on us. Uh, and, and 
this administration is very concerned that whatever sanctions we have are generally going to be shared by all of us, not just by uh, the U.S. Senator, yeah, let me there. ask you a follow-up question. Sorry, go ahead, Natalie. Well, Derek, would you just be okay if I just ask the senator? I, I want to. You, you. Uh, I came back to D.C. and heard your inaugural speech on China as you became a senator. How do you think these sanctions have sent a strong, strong message to China? You, you read my mind, Natalie. That was the que the follow-up question right? I was going to ask. Oh, I'm getting so interested because you've been, you've made it a hallmark of your service to um, be very informed about China. Um, I think uh, China uh, is still intent on uh, ultimately grabbing Taiwan. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they prefer to do that in a peaceful manner, but I think they'd be willing to do it through invasion. Uh, I don't think they're inclined to do so now. I think it'd be a mistake of them to do it now, uh, uh, in part because doing so would obviously lead to sanctions uh, on China. And if you sanction Russia and China, there's no question but that the world would go into a major recession slash depression and that would hurt china as much as it would hurt all the rest of us uh, and uh, uh, they they would have unrest uh, I, I think they recognize that's not the right move uh, for them at this point but uh, as they look to the future i think they're saying wow look what happened uh and uh, i think they would be calculating all right this is what would happen to us uh, if we were to invade uh, uh, taiwan and so they will be looking for ways to avoid the power of our sanctions, how to get out of the SWIFT banking system, how to move to a currency other than the dollar for, uh, for international trade. They're gonna find every way they can to say, wow, these US sanctions and these NATO sanctions have teeth and uh, we gotta find a way around them so that when we finally take our, uh, our way upon the people of, of Taiwan, uh, we don't have the kind of uh, economic impact that we're seeing Russia suffer. So it's a, uh, uh, in some ways, this is kind of a, you know, it's like playing golf and seeing the person ahead of you putt. Uh, they're sort of seeing, you know, how the uh, how the ground, uh, you know, how the um, the ground lies, and and will be taking lessons from it. But I don't think it will dissuade them from their ultimate aim, uh, which is unification with uh, Taiwan. So we set up this um, webinar to uh, have Senator Romney give us give us the big picture, the lay of the land. Uh, Natalie's given us the, the macroeconomic perspective, and we've invited uh, Miles Hansen from the World Trade Center, Utah, our, our third presenter today, to talk about what this means for Utah businesses. Miles, thanks for joining us. We, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Derek, and, and a huge thanks to Senator Romney for your leadership, uh, not just on Russia, but China as well. And just to underscore that point, uh, China absolutely is watching. And, and not only learning lessons that, you know, now may, not be, now may not be the right time, but I think we need to work very uh, aggressively as a nation to understand that they are seeing the putt that's been, uh, that, that Putin is putting. And they will react, they will respond, they'll adapt their strategies as they move forward. And so we need to stay nimble as a country and continue to do everything we can to, to hold Putin responsible for his criminal war in Russia. And at the same time, continue, Senator Romney, following uh, your lead on, on China, uh, recognizing that over the course of the century, that is uh, going to continue to be the biggest threat to uh, our, our country and our economy and our companies uh, across the country, but also here in Utah. And Derek, just thinking uh, three uh, quick points, and then we can jump into uh, any Q&A. Uh, I think Senator Romney touched on Putin's motivation why Ukraine and why now? And I think, I think it's helpful to, to really underscore that because we need to understand his motivations as we try to think about how long this is going to last, how it's going to play out and what it means for companies. And, and why Ukraine, you know, uh, Senator Romney mentioned uh, the, uh, how much the dissolution of the Soviet Union stung Vladimir Putin is I think about the five or six years that I've lived in the former Soviet Union in Russia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan and Armenia and worked elsewhere uh, I think it's important for us as Americans to think back to how much pride we felt as Americans when we won the Cold War, right? We won, they lost our uh, liberal democracy, our free markets uh, were very, very successful. And the pain of the collapse of the Soviet Union was very, very deep and very, very real for uh, millions of Russians and also others and not living in Russia itself. 
And so that is something that has left an indelible mark on Vladimir Putin for all these years. And so he has been working very aggressively to restore that. And for the why now, uh, I think there's no question that is we uh, all witnessed the debacle of all our withdrawal from Afghanistan, where we just said last summer, where, where we demonstrated a complete lack of resolve and even worse, a lack of competence uh, as we looked at the divisiveness and the challenges we have here domestically, that Vladimir Putin saw a window of opportunity. And I've been so encouraged over the past few weeks, and, and particularly since the invasion began, to see the way that the Biden administration, despite uh, the failures of last summer, has stepped up to provide some real leadership uh, and make sure that Russia uh, incurs costs for this criminal invasion of Ukraine. The second uh, point is that I um, spent a lot of time working on, on foreign policy issues and, and working with uh, members of uh, the Bush team, uh, the Obama team, uh, of course, the Trump team. And in 2008, uh, when Putin uh, took over parts of Georgia, uh, it was during the Bush administration. And in the years since, uh, many members of the Bush team have expressed their regret that we didn't do more to respond to what Putin did in 2008. Flash forward to 2014 in Crimea, uh, many members of the Obama team have also publicly and privately uh, acknowledged the mistake of not doing more at that point in time. And so I think two lessons, one, a, a weak response has created a scenario where Putin is, is now getting more aggressive. And two, as a nation, we need to make sure we don't make that mistake again. And what I've seen so far is very encouraging, but this is gonna be a long drawn out conflict. Uh, the last you know, major uh, battle for an ur urban area for a city was in Mosul, uh, Iraq and that lasted nine months. And so I think we all need to get comfortable with the fact that this is going to be heartbreaking and tragic and that Vladimir Putin is gonna do everything he can to obliterate uh, Ukraine and that this is gonna be long and drawn out. And so we need to maintain resolve as a nation with our partners and allies. And we need to make sure that we don't uh, watering down these steps that we've taken so far so that five or six years down the road, we don't look back and say, we wish we had done more. And so what does this mean for, for Utah businesses? This means that we need to uh, buckle up and, and really focus in on our resilience. We need to acknowledge that this is gonna be a, a long drawn out conflict. Uh, this is having a fundamental uh, impact on the way that, that, that Europe is structured, not just politically and from a military perspective, perspective but economically as well. Uh, we can't approach doing business in Europe as, uh, as business per usual. But this is going to have long lasting impacts, not just on commodities and, and mining and energy, but in other aspects of the economy as well. And so uh, Utah businesses that are doing business in Europe should uh, be working very aggressively to take a step back, reevaluate their business strategies in, in Europe and ask themselves, how is this now going to impact things? And we've got great experts uh, here in, in the state that can help assist with that, but also you know, what are the different scenarios? If this were to spread it further in Eastern Europe, what would that mean for my business? If this ends up becoming you know, a, a, a second Cold War that lasts many years or, or decades where you have parts of Europe that are obviously you know, cut out from our financial systems, uh, the rest of Europe more integrated, what does that look like? And so companies need to be reevaluating re their strategies and then taking a, a step back even further, uh, our companies need to, to recognize that uh, what we are witnessing is the result of uh, increased uh, conflict out in the world. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, in a meeting, we were talking about the, the, the two mega trends, the two rise of, of, of nationalism and tribalism. To be very clear, nationalism is not patriotism. Nationalism is a pursuit of one's own interests, a country's interests in a zero sum fashion at the expense of, of all those around you. Putin is a nationalist not a patriot. What he is doing to Russia right now, the Russian people, is going to be bad for Russia's long-term strategic interests, but he is pursuing you know, uh, increased influence, power, glory, territory for Russia itself. Nationalism historically leads to more war and more conflict. At the same time, here in the United States, in, in Europe, elsewhere, we're seeing an increase of tribalism, right? This is you know, infighting and the divisiveness that we see with a broken political system in Washington, D.C., you know, all the, 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 the political fights that I won't go into, but that we are all very well aware of, that frustrates the ability of a country to formulate and execute sound policy. And that makes this rules-based international system that the United States built 
following World War II that's led to so much uh, prosperity, it makes that system more brittle, which creates opportunities for the, the nationalists and the aggressors to take advantage of the situation. And what all this means is we should expect more conflict, more challenges out in the world. Uh, Natalie, I loved your US economic risk matrix, right? Over time, we're gonna see more and more risks and more economic disruption, which means companies need to be thinking through resiliency, how to mitigate the risk and make sure that they stay nimble with how they're investing in, in, in identifying new markets. But at the same time, we need to recognize that here in the state of Utah, like Natalie showed, we are, we are and will continue to fare better uh, than just about anywhere else in the nation and the world, which means amidst all of this disruption, there will continue to be significant opportunities for Utah companies. And in some ways, the challenges out in the world and the strength that we have here in the state of Utah will increase the relative competitive edge of our companies. And so our companies should not you know, jump down into their foxholes and retrench, but instead figure out how to be agile, how to understand what's happening, but then to see the opportunities amidst the disruption, to go out there and, and, and to go and find ways to compete and win despite the challenging environment that we're in now and will likely continue to be in in the months and years to come. Miles, thank you for that. I've, I've got several questions that, that I want to ask you. We've got great questions that are coming in from our attendees today. Before I ask you the first question, though, I want to underscore something that you said, and I'm really grateful that you did point this out, that, that, that it's not Ukrainians that are suffering under, under Putin's uh, deplorable behavior, but it's Russians themselves. And Natalie, you showed us the graphs that prove this point, and I think it's important that we, that we remember that this is a war of choice and, and, that the, and that the Russian people are suffering as well be, because of the horrific choice that, that uh, Vladimir Putin is making. Um, my question to you, first of all, Miles, is this. Um, obviously, everybody knows you're the head of, of the World Trade Center Utah. Uh, you're, you're an international business expert, but not everyone might know that you're also a foreign relations expert and you're a veteran of the State Department you're a veteran of, of the White House and, and a national security expert who's advised presidents. We, it would be fascinating, I'm sure, to our participants today to, to hear from you, to give us an insight. What's happening in the White House right now? I mean, how, how are these issues? How are these kinds of uh, global, important, uh, life-threatening issues dealt with in, in a White House. You're, you are you in a unique position to pull back the curtain for us and help us understand that. Thanks, Derek. And I'll tell you, I know one thing's for certain. I'm getting a lot more sleep here focusing on international business than my uh, former colleagues back at the White House and the National Security Council. So Derek, what, what's happening right now is uh, you think about all the different tools in the US foreign policy toolkit. We have the sanctions, and that's the Treasury Department. We have the military in providing, you know, the, what Senator Romney talked about with, you know, us getting uh, MiG uh, aircraft from Poland, so then we're going to be able to support that to the Ukrainians. That's the Department of Defense. We have all the effort to build coalitions and to exert uh, uh, pressure and leverage and cajole and convince our partners around the world to, to jump on board. You know, that's the diplomatic work that the State Department is doing. You know, we have our intelligence agencies that are very effective it, 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 it getting information about what's happening in the world, but also uh, undermining, you know, say, for example, political support for Vladimir Putin in, in Russia. So we have all these different tools in the toolkit. And really the job at the National Security Council in the White House is to bring everybody together. And so what that looks like are meetings in the Situation Room, and they happen at, you know, at, at an assistant secretary level, they have to happen at a depu deputy, say, secretary level, the secretary level, uh, with the national security advisor chairing and then when it's a a, a decision has been made uh, a unanimous consensus is built around a particular course of action or uh there's some difference in the interagency a decision has to be made then the president comes in and so the, the purpose of this is to develop a coordinated u.s uh stra approach to dealing with a crisis like this and that means uh you know very early mornings very late nights uh, virtually around the clock, people in there working across the U.S. government to try to develop uh, policies and actions that will help protect and advance our interest, and then working with our partners and allies around the world to get them to buy in and be supportive of what we're trying to do. 
As someone who uh, lived in the uh, former Soviet Union, how how do you how are the people around Ukraine? How are those leaders? How are those people feeling right now? You know, it's interesting, Derek. Uh, Kazakhstan is a country that experienced some uh, unrest uh, a, a month and a half ago or so, a couple months ago. Uh, they called in and got support from Russia, uh, which, uh, you know, right, uh, Vladimir Putin is both the arsonist and the fireman, right? So they stirred up trouble in Kazakhstan. It led to protests, threatened the government. Uh, Russia undoubtedly was involved in fomenting that. But then the Kazakh government reached out and, and asked the Russians to come in to help quell the protests. And that, I'm sure at the time, uh, was viewed very positively by Vladimir Putin because he assumed the Kazakhstan then would be in his back pocket if he needed Kazakhstan support in Ukraine. Uh, after the war broke out and the invasion began, and it was clear that Europe was going to respond very, uh, very strongly. Uh, Putin sent uh, high level officials to Kazakhstan to request their support in sending equipment and troops. And the Kazakhs said no. And they said, we're not going to join in this war, which I think is super important because these people who were beholden to Putin uh, just a few weeks before in Kazakhstan uh, still said, we don't want to send our people to fight and die in Ukraine because we disagree with what you're doing. So I think as you look out across the former Soviet Union and the various Soviet republics, uh, Russia has built up varying degrees of leverage in each of those countries, and it uses that leverage to get people to toe the line but they're having a hard time towing this line and that will continue as we see these images come out of, 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 of Putin's, you know, really criminal efforts to obliterate Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. And there's no question that the other Soviet, former Soviet republics see that and know that's not a future that they want for their countries. And so they're not going to be uh, as supportive as what Putin expected them to be. Miles, I, I want to ask you one more question specific to Utah businesses and then and then I'm going to ask a final question and have both both you and Natalie respond to it. With regards to the Utah businesses, Miles, we, we, you mentioned some things that Utah businesses can do as far as uh, dampening or softening the impacts of, of what might be happening globally. But I'd love to hear from you on what Utah businesses can do to help in the effort. One of the, one of the most interesting things to me is that the sanctions have not just been government sanctions. We have seen businesses around the world uh, impose their own sanctions by saying, we're not going to do this or, or we're not going to do that or we're gonna start doing this other thing. What are your thoughts about what Utah businesses could do to, to participate in that as well? So Derek, I, I love uh, how Utah steps up to provide, to have a positive leavening effect on the nation and the world all the time, but particularly in times of crisis. Uh, for anybody who's not aware, uh, Larry H. Miller uh, Companies is, is leading a fundraiser. I believe over $2 million have been raised to date. This is the private sector, the business community here in the state, stepping up in a very major way to provide the financial support uh, that the Ukrainian people are going to need, as at this point we have nearly 2 million refugees that fled the country. And so for one, I'd encourage anybody to go to lhm.com uh, so grateful for, for their leadership in the community. They've been stalwart, you know, partners of the Salt Lake Chamber, World Trade Center, Utah, uh, I'm sure Gardner Institute as well. And this is just another example of Utah businesses stepping up in a major way. On the, 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 the far side of that, some companies may say, well, I don't have the platform or the resources of Larry H. Miller uh, companies. And I just got an email from a, a and I want to use their name because it's a great uh, story, but I, I, I don't want to uh, put them in the spotlight if they don't want to be there, but a small business, a growing business that we've been working with to help them grow around the world. I know cash flow is tight. They need every sale they can get and every international sale that they can get. And they reached out, uh, just asked for some advice, and they made the decision to cancel a very significant order that they had in Russia. And they said, you know what? Now is not the time where we want to be making money in Russia. We want to contribute in the way that we can contribute. And so they've made that decision to do that. I know it will be a, a bit of a sacrifice for the company, but I'd really encourage any companies that if you're if you're doing business in Russia, I think there's a, a, a reason why so many companies all around the world are saying, you know what, we want to stand up in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. We want to lead with our pocketbooks and we're willing to take a step back right now, even at some risk, to send a message to Vladimir Putin and his government and those around him who could uh, affect some positive change uh, there to, to take notice. 
Excellent. Anyone can visit lhm.com. Drive to assist is, as Miles said, taking contributions, uh, financial contributions, as well as needed goods that are going to be delivered, uh, assisted in that delivery by Intermountain Healthcare. So many others who are participating. We all can do our part. Final question to each of you. Um, it's a broad question, so you can take this from any perspective you want, economic, uh, local, geopolitical, uh, and as, as well as foreign relations. Where do we go from here? Natalie? Well, Derek, I'm gonna just recommend four quick things. Uh, let's continue to unify. Uh, and this will come first by avoiding criticizing uh, President Biden for higher gas prices and blame uh, Vladimir Putin for higher gas prices. If we do that, we can give the White House the political room they need to do some hard things. Second, I would um, work with Republicans to pass uh, legislation and change regulations that facilitate greater domestic oil production. Uh, third, I would do no harm. And if Miles is right that this is going to be a, a prolonged conflict, then the um, expensive uh, deficit finance social legislation that's on the, that's on the board uh, would only do harm for inflation. And so do no harm. And then lastly, uh, be prepared to sacrifice. Uh, we are so blessed and so privileged. Be prepared to sacrifice. Thank you, Natalie. Miles? I agree. Agree with everything Natalie said, and just to underscore, we need to make sure that we do not politicize this, this war and our national response. Think about the pandemic. Think about how politicized things became and how that uh, hampered our ability as a nation to rise up and to push through some of those challenging issues. There are going to be some challenges. There is going to be some costs that we all, all are going to bear, and we need to make sure that we're engaging in a way that is uh, motivated in our in our comments and our civil engagement and how we are you know uh, asking our federal delegation to, to to represent Utah in a way that's constructive doesn't mean agree with everything that the that the Biden administration or anybody else is doing but in a way that is motivated by, as a uh, by unity and rallying together as a nation to stand up to this international uh, threat and challenge the second point is to continue to engage and hearkening back to what I talked about before. There is and will continue to be global disruption. We have an incredible base of strength here in the state of Utah. And that reason is, is you know, we could talk for, for an hour about all the reasons why we should continue to feel great optimism. We should continue to invest. We should continue to get out to compete and win in markets here in the state, across the nation and around the world. And nothing that's happening in Russia and Ukraine uh, should signal us that it's time for us to, to retreat and withdraw and turn insular because the world needs constructive solutions to all these different problems and innovators and leaders here in the state of Utah have those solutions. A big thanks to everyone for joining us today for this important discussion. And of course, a big thanks to our presenters, our presenters, Senator Romney, Natalie Gochner, and Miles Hansen. As a reminder, this recording of the webinar will be available later on today at the Salt Lake Chamber website. Thanks again, everyone. Bye now.